title, and then you can use that for notes. I entitled this today, This Doctor Hates the Cancer Of. This doctor hates the cancer of. And we're going to pray and dive right in. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word this morning. We pray that as we journey through this section of scripture, that you will open our hearts and open our minds to what you said to your people at that time and how it applies for us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 8, that's where we're going to pick up from where Daniel left off last week. Isaiah 9, verse 8, and we're going to go through chapter 10, verse 15. So we're going to take this uh, as we have in the last few weeks in in chunks. I'll I'll read it, and then we'll get through uh, that section of Scripture and the points in that. This really has to deal with a few different things this morning. And, and so it has to do with decisions made. And because of the decisions made in life, there are judgments that happen, good, bad, and ugly. We'd all agree with that, right? Decisions made, judgments that happen. And that's really what we see here in this section of Scripture as well. Now, we're going to talk about something going into this that's really not shared with a lot with the people these days in churches, because I don't think people like talking about the wrath of God much, but this is where this is at, and the wrath of God in the Bible reveals something completely different than what people think. If someone is not a Christian, they're going to think that the wrath of God is something that's cruel. You know, how could God be like that? Have you heard people say that, how could God allow this to happen? But the wrath of God in the Bible reveals not Him being cruel, but Him in humility. I want you to think about that for a moment. The wrath of God means something. You go, what what do you mean by being humble? He's willing to get involved in our lives. The almighty, all-powerful God is willing to get involved in my life, in your life. We matter to Him. The Bible says in 1 John 4, God is love. And I will acknowledge the Bible never says God is anger. But it couldn't say that God is love without his anger. As we have journeyed through over the last few weeks the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapters 1 through 5 describe the spiritual disaster that we all are in our own power and how we don't follow God. We are a disaster. Anyone disagree with that? No. Chapter 6 through 11 show us the triumph of God's grace over that failure. And so we got some work to do here in chapter 9 because Isaiah believes in God's wrath. And he can see the wrath of God taking us further actually into something. He's seeing the wrath of God taking us into God's grace taking us into God's grace in ways that we would never, ever go without His wrath. So what is the wrath of God? His wrath is His active, resolute opposition to all evil. Okay? If you wanted a definition of the wrath of God... His wrath is an act of resolute opposition to all evil. So God delights in us, right? He delights in us. His delight in us is is spontaneous. 
It's, it's part of who he is. But his wrath is provoked by the defiance of his creatures. Another key thing to remember as we journey through this, God's love will never make peace with our evil. It's just not possible. What we must understand is that God's wrath is actually perfect. It's no less perfect than in Romans 2, 4, where it says the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience is perfect. So is his wrath. God's wrath is not some sort of moody, vindictive wrath. It is the solemn determination of a doctor cutting away the cancer that's killing the patient. This doctor hates the cancer of sin. And for God, the anger is personal. It's not detached. It's not clinical. It's not just a look at some statistics. This doctor hates the cancer of sin because he loves the carriers of the disease. And his goal, his plan, is to rid the universe of all of its afflictions. To create what? A new heaven and a new earth. This is all found in the gospel. The magnitude of the gospel promotes us to invent a word that I'm going to invent today. So you can write this word down. The magnitude of the gospel prompts us to like God's loving anger kindness. One word. Loving anger kindness. In his loving anger kindness, God destroys the guilt of sinners at the cross of Jesus. He will destroy all remaining sin in the hearts of those that take refuge in Christ. He will destroy all the suffering here in the world where the kingdom of Jesus creates a world that will be so much better than we could ever imagine. The power of the gospel, everyone, the good news of Jesus Christ that he came and died for us to take away our sins, to be the good doctor, to remove the cancer of sin. The gospel then actually sobers us even as it cheers us. And we, we've got to ask some serious questions when we think of the power of the loving anger kindness of God. We can't just have some wishy-washy opinions about God. Have you ever seen people that have wishy-washy opinions about God? So, what do you think about God? Well, you know, he's, he's my buddy. So is my dog. What does this mean? See, we've got to have some serious questions that we need to be asking. Who can stand before this God? Who can stand before his righteousness? Isaiah had that question, right? Who can endure the heat of his wrath? It says his wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken into pieces by him. And I didn't come up with those questions on my own. That's actually Nahum 1.6. Who can stand before his righteous anger? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Now Isaiah chooses some strong words in this section of scripture that we're going to go through. To show God and his power to us. And as we go through this, when you see the word anger, it is used elsewhere in the Hebrew language to mean knows. What? <laughs> it's using a word to, to mean knows. Why? Well, what happens when you're angry? A fuming rage. I, I picture this huge bull. And there was this time 
when I was in college and we were in a singing group and we were up in Colorado and this rancher had us out to his place. And I'm a city guy. I grew up in Phoenix. I, I went to school out here. You know, my idea of cow is what you eat in its red and in a package, you know. I, I really have no real cow experience. And he's like, yeah, why don't you guys go and, and see the cows and get into the, uh, over there and just see, well, you know, these, these, they're huge animals, right? You've been to the fair, maybe you've seen them, maybe you've seen some cows up close and personal. They are big. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to go in with the cows, and I did. I went in with the cows, but it wasn't a cow that was the problem. It was the bull that was the problem in that arena, and the bull looked me right in the eyes. You know what his reaction was? A fuming rage. And I said, who can stand before his righteous anger? <laughs> and I ran. <laughs> Fortunately, I had five feet to go and he had 75. And I had someone else in the ring with me and all I had to be was faster than that person. But it's the picture there, the fuming rage. The word translated wrath here means outburst. The word translated fury means indignation, which you will see in the New American Standard Version as well. Very human words, anger, outburst, wrath, fury, indignation. But Isaiah finds these words useful to describe the perfect passion burning in the heart of God to do something, and it's not to beat you up. It's the perfect passion to destroy evil and bring us into the triumph of grace. It is the vocabulary of God's fiery perfection. His wrath works in two ways with opposite results. On one hand, his wrath condemns those who finally reject him, right? At the end, there are a lot of people that just prefer hell. And at the end, they get what they prefer. On the other hand, God ang God's anger purifies all who love him. His fatherly discipline enriches us in everything we long for in our deepest heart. And this anger does not afflict us as we deserve, but only as we need. Now, as I said right at the beginning of this, before we dive into this section of Scripture, our generation has almost completely lost sight of the wrath of God. You can go to churches where they will tell you nothing about the wrath of God because they're afraid you will run and hide from the church. Here's the truth, though. We cannot understand our salvation without the awareness of the wrath of God. We can't understand our salvation unless we understand that we, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. So the decision that's made that Isaiah is talking about here is if God's people choose evil, His wrath works with an unrelenting force on that Let's look at verses 8 through 12 together of chapter 9. The Lord sends a message against Jacob, and it falls on Israel. And all the people know it, that is, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, asserting in pride and in arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with smooth stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord raises against them adversaries from reason and spurs their enemies on 
the Arameans on the east and the Philistines on the west. Pause there, if you will. The key statement that you see in this section is in verse 12. His anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Picture this outstretched hand of God's judgment. That's what you need to picture. The outstretched hand of God's judgment. We see it in verse 12. We see it in verse 17. We receive it, see, receive it again and see it in verse 21. And then chapter 10, verse 4. And God judges them for something. Back up in verse 9, what does he judge them for? Pride. In thinking that their present difficulties were temporary and the nation could rebuild itself better than before. Oh yeah, we got these people that are going to be coming against us, but we will rebuild better. I think I've heard someone say that. It's arrogant. You see, Israel had come under military attack. Bricks had fallen. Sycamores had been cut down, as we understand here. But the people aren't thinking about the meaning of that. They're laughing it off. They're seeing their setbacks, actually, as opportunities to rebuild the past, even improve on it. But their self-exalting past is what got them in trouble in the first place. And boy, do we see this through human history. One of my favorite characters in modern human history is Winston Churchill. And in his final volume of his work on the Second World War and what it all was about in his history of the Second World War, was a very interesting theme. And I just want to read it word for word what the theme was. How the great democracies triumphed and so were able to resume the follies which had nearly cost them their lives. And that was written less than 10 years after World War II was over. How the great democracies triumphed and so were able to resume the follies which had nearly cost them their life. That's exactly what was going on here. Oh, we'll just rebuild better. No reflection, no humility. But whether they came, whether it came as a sudden disaster or gradual just falling apart, events have meaning, don't they? Because God is at work in history. You see in verse 11, you see these adversaries of reason, the, the Assyrians. The Lord himself raises them up. And that's the irony of this. The Lord matches Israel's uplifted pride and newly erected buildings and freshly grown trees by raising up everyone's worst nightmare the Assyrians. It's kind of the, the axiom lying at the foundation of the moral order that we all live in, found in James 4, found in 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Israel ignored that truth, so God's hand was stretched out in judgment to them. And so we see that first in verses 8 through 12. In 13 through 17, we see that the shamelessness then leads to irresponsible leaders. Hello? Anyway, Isaiah 9, 13 through 17. Yet the people do not turn back to him who struck them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts, 
So the Lord cuts off the head and tail from Israel, both palm branch and bulrush in a single day. The head is the elder and honorable man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. For those who guide these people are leading them astray, and those who are guided by them are brought into confusion. Therefore, the Lord does not take pleasure in their young men, nor does he have pity on their orphans or their widows, for every one of them is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth is speaking foolishness. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. When God strikes you, everyone, when God strikes you, the biggest mistake you can make is to turn away from him. Instead of turning to him and inquiring of him, O oh Lord, what have I done? What needs to change? So when Israel was wandering away, they were being led. Man, this sounds so familiar. They were being led by the decisions and declarations of leaders who were sacrificing the good of their people for their own personal benefit. They were concerned about their reputation. They were concerned about their success. They were concerned about their profit. They were concerned about that. They were not concerned about people's safety. They were not concerned about faith. They were not concerned about the holiness of the men and women of God that had been put under their care. And so what happened to the flock? It was swallowed up, swept up into the resistance and rebellion, into pain and destruction. God hates sin. So we see there, this shamelessness leads to irresponsible leaders, which leads to God's judgment. We see in verses 18 through 21 as we continue, that then the self-seeking that happens with these people, it leads to self-destruction. For wickedness burns like a fire, it consumes briars and thorns, it even sets the thickets of the forest aflame, and they roll upward in a column of smoke. By the fury of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No man spares his brother. They they slice off what is on the right hand, but still are hungry. And they eat what is on the left hand, but they are not satisfied. Each of them eats the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim Manasseh. And together they are against Judah. In spite of all of this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. His anger, his judgment is still stretched out. Isaiah discerns this inherently destructive power of sin. What does the inherently destructive power of sin look like in our lives? Verse 18, wickedness burns like a fire. Now, everyone in the room, the pain sin brings is not an addition to sin. So the the wrath of God is not an addition to sin piled on top. The pain sin brings is the outworking of sin itself. And there's even a deeper meaning in that wildfire sweeping through everything. Verse 19, once again. By the fury of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No man spares his brother. Have you seen the pain of sin, the wrath, the burning of sin sweep through a family? Have you seen that? It's awful, isn't it? Have you seen it? In a church, it's awful. The fire burning through a church of sin. The wrath of God is in the damage that the sin afflicts. 
So for example, self-seeking people are devouring one another as we see here in verses 19 through 21. Here's an interesting thing. I don't know, you may not know this, but if you want to write this down, It'll help you understand all of the things going on. So you got Israel, which is the northern kingdom. You've got Judah, which is the southern kingdom. This is specifically talking about Israel. You see a little bit mentioned for Judah here in this section of Scripture too. But of the last six kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, five came to the throne by assassination. Human sin unleashing itself on humans. Now, you may be sitting there and going, okay, I have no idea why this has anything to do with me, really. Yeah, I get the the pain of sin. I get all of that. But it does address us. You may want to look at Galatians 5.15. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Direct reference. In God's hand, as we see at the end of this statement, is still stretched out. And so we see the self-seeking leads to self-destruction. We see that then as it goes into chapter 10, the first four verses, that injustice leads to helplessness. Verse 1, woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions. Does this apply today? Yes. So as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights so that the widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. Now what will you do in the day of punishment and in the devastation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the captives or fall among the slain. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Isaiah is envisioning corrupt leaders, both public and private, of Israel, huddling really as prisoners of war, tossed onto a heap of of dead bodies as in actually what happened in the fact when Assyria overran Israel in 722 B.C. And once again, you see that language there, and God's hand was still stretched out. It's still stretched out. It's still stretched out. And I was thinking about this. this All of these things are still going on. It's getting worse and worse and worse, right? Just things are bad and bad and bad and worse and worse and worse. Why? We have a group of people who are not turning back to God. And I was thinking about this this week, and I I really came down to this. You and I will never wear God down until He relents. Have you ever thought, I'm just going to keep going after God and finally He's going to give up and give me what I want? Or change the circumstances of my sin. You and I will never wear God down until He relents and we get our own way. I'm just going to tell you, everyone, in God, we have met our match. Whom should we fear? Whose favor should we cherish? You know what happens in our world? So many people fear people and try to get in favor with them. They fear people and try to get in favor with them. It's all wrong. There's a God in heaven who loves us more than than anything 
else more than any person ever will. It is his wrath, not theirs, we should fear. When the government tells me to do something that is against God's word, I should not fear the government. What I should fear is not following God's word. It is His favor, not the world's favor, that I need to cherish. It is not the powers of this world with whom we have to really deal with at the end. It is God and God alone. You see the decisions that we need to make? In whom do we trust? In whom do we follow? And we have to understand, in Israel's case, they were following their own self-guided, misguided way. They had made their decision. And then the judgment happens. In verses 5 through 15. Look at verse 5 for a moment. You see, God's wrath is actually empowering. And I want you to see what I mean by that. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. It's actually one of the most important passages in the Bible on the sovereignty of God. (laughs) You may be going, okay, I have no clue what you're talking about. How is that important? Yeah, I can see what it means, the rod of my anger. We use this term around here quite a bit about the sovereignty of God. I want to remind everyone what that means. What is the sovereignty of God? When we say that, what does that mean? It means the sovereignty of God means that as ruler of the universe, God is free and has the right to do whatever He wants. He is not bound or limited by the dictates of His created beings. He is not limited by us. He is in complete control over everything that happens here on earth. God's will is the final cause of all things. The sovereignty of God. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Isaiah loves the sovereignty of God, but the nation God used as the disciplinary rod in his hand was something interesting. The rod that he used was this country, Assyria, who was evil itself. The Assyrians, by many historians, were called the Nazis of the ancient Near East. They were not good. They were awful. And God has purpose in in deploying this awful country to take care of Israel. Verses 6 through 11. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is... Its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. For it says, Are not my princes all kings? Is not Kalno like Karchemish? Or Hamath like Arpad? Or Samaria like Damascus? Is my hand has reached out to the kingdoms of the idols? whose graven images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria. His rod was even worse than Jerusalem and Samaria and what they were doing. Verse 11, Shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images just as I've done to Samaria and her idols? Essentially what's going on here is Isaiah's 
preparing for the statement, wait one minute here. Because Israel, their readers, listeners of this would have said, we aren't a godless nation, they are. And they would be saying to Isaiah, how could you then say that God is sending this cruel war machine against us? But God doesn't respect a double standard. The sin he judges out in the world, he also judges among his own people. Right? Belonging to God does not protect you from discipline. It makes us all the more accountable to obey. We are obligated to live for him. If we refuse, we are in practical terms, as Paul says in Romans 8, if we refuse to live for him, we are godless. Because if you don't live for him, that's proof that God's not in you, that the Spirit's not in you. And what's interesting here is God is able to use godless worldly powers to discipline his godless covenant people. Human oppressors don't even have to be aware of God to be used by God. Verses 8 through 11 actually reveal what Assyria was thinking. Not only were they salivating over the northern Israelite kingdom as a trophy of expansion, they saw nothing to stop their advance all the way to Jerusalem to the south. The tool in God's hand was very impressed with itself. So it was evil itself. Actually, I dug this up this week. I found it. It is in the annals of Adad Neriari II, who was an Assyrian leader before this captivity. And it's pretty interesting what this leader has to say about himself, and their country. In these days, when at the command of the great gods, my Lord, lordly sovereignty has, my lordly sovereignty has manifested itself. Going forth to plunder the goods of the lands, I am royal, I am lordly, I am mighty, I am honored, I am exalted, I am glorified, I am powerful, I am all-powerful, I am brilliant, I am lion brave, I am manly, I am supreme, I am noble. Oh boy. That's the country that God used. Ick. See, but Isaiah can see two sovereignties going on in this. The sovereignty of man is there, but the greater sovereignty of God is there. God's domain is able to use man's domain, whether man wants it that way or not. Human power cannot outflank God. Just because God deploys human ambition doesn't mean that he condones that arrogance. Being used by God does not exempt anyone from being humbled by God. The truth here is twofold. On one hand, God is on the side of the victor. The ebb and flow of this messy thing called human history shows that. It was God's will in 722 B.C. that Assyria conquer Israel. This is a tough one for us. Because you look at this day and age that we live in. For example, it is God's will that the Ukrainian-Russian war is ongoing. You have a hard time with me saying that? But it's God's will. 
God judges opportunistic people and nations, even if he uses them for his own higher purpose. God is able to use evil without being compromised by it. He holds every useful villain as accountable. No one is getting away with anything, not even arrogant speech and boastful looks. So God has purpose in deploying this nation. Why? Because he's punishing pride. Verse 12, so it will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. Isn't this interesting? Now he's punishing the rod, what was the rod. For he has said, by the power of my hand and by my wisdom, I did this. For I have understanding, and I removed the boundaries of the peoples and plundered their treasures. And like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants, and my hand reached to the riches of the peoples like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. And there was not one that flapped its wing or opened its beak or chirped. God appoints days of reckoning within history. And he has a final day of judgment waiting for the end of history, doesn't he? I think the end of World War II and some of the pictures of the devastation of Germany and Berlin specifically bore witness to the wrath of God in our time. but Berlin was given another chance. But as Churchill has said, did say, what's happened? We just go back to what we did before. The divine wrath on the future day will not have a remedial effect or intention. It's going to be done. What the Bible keeps saying to us is that God is never going to accept human pride. It's unsustainable. It's folly. And God's going to humble you, as in verse 15. God's wrath is humbling. Verse 15, as we look at this together. Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who yields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it, or like a rod lifting him who is not wood. The Assyrians were, what this is saying, everyone, the Assyrians were a mere instrument in the hand of God to accomplish his purposes, to be employed at his will. The statement of truth is designed to humble them. And if there be any truth that humbles sinners, it is that they are in the hands of God, that he will accomplish his purposes by them, that when they are laying plans against him, he will overrule them for his own glory, that they will be arrested, restrained, directed, whatever, just as he pleases. Man in his scheme of pride, vanity, should not boast. So what does this mean? As we round the last corner here. What's the application in all of this? God is not a cardboard cutout. God is real. With real anger. With real love. God has wonderful things He wants to talk to us about. 
God's grace can recover everything we have failed to be. But God will not negotiate with our self-exalting. As we struggle against God in this area so many times in our lives, one author said it this way, our relationship with God is a dramatic engagement, something like a bout of fencing with a succession of offensive retreats, dodges, and rallies. But you know what may happen in your life? I was thinking about it this week. God may walk up to you at some point and punch you right in the nose and knock you flat. Have you ever had God do that to you? And as you're sitting there on the ground wondering, what was that all about? He may kick you in the teeth after that. You go, that's not a really, that, that's not a very nice picture of God, Scott. Think of Job. Wouldn't you say that's what happened to Job? Hey, I, I, I've lost everything. Now I've lost my family. Now I've lost, I mean, you just, you, you got kicked in the teeth, got kicked in the face time after time after time. Why? Why does God seem to blindside us like that? Because the only way we'll listen many times is the hard way. He would rather lead us gently beside the still waters. But He will reach out His hand to us in wrath if necessary. One of the great Puritan writers was wondering about why his life was hard sometimes. And he said this, I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and, and grace. Might know more of his salvation, know and seek more earnestly his face. Twas he who taught me thus to pray and he, I trust, has answered prayer. But it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hoped that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the anger, angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate me more crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembled, crying. Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answered prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free and break your schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest seek thy all in me. That's why God does this. God's wrath is about love. 1 Peter 5, 6, as it says on the screens, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, He may exalt you. He's refining you. He's doing the sucker punch at times that you don't understand because you've exalted yourself in some way that wasn't right, that wasn't His way, that was sin. But at the end of the day, when you humble yourself, when you put your faith in Him, and you put your faith under the mighty hand of God, at the proper time, what happens? He picks you up. And He exalts you and says, this is my child. This is my son. 
my daughter In him, I am well pleased. I know them. They're my people. But it's a journey getting there, isn't it? And maybe today you're sitting here and you're going, yeah, I've been sucker punched a lot in my life by God. And you can share that with people about what you've learned about how the self-exalting doesn't work. How God will tear that down just like he tore Israel down. But what he builds, he builds, is so much better. Let's pray.